starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Nick Weiner from Open Channels, and co-presenting with me is Sarah Carr from the EBM Tools Network. Uh, we're delighted to have Edward Hind, Jake Kreitzer, and Nicola Smith from uh, presenting on their paper today, Fostering Effective International Collaboration for Marine Science in Small Island States. Uh, you'll notice in the GoToWebinar control panel, there's a handout section. Uh, that paper, along with a supplementary uh, template on a memorandum of, memorandum of understanding, is attached there. So if you click either of those handout icons, you can download the paper and that supplement directly to your desktop. Uh, also, just a few housekeeping notes with GoToWebinar. Uh, if you click the little red orange arrow icon in the top right hand corner of your screen that'll pull out or hide the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, within there is the, the handouts which I've just mentioned. There's also a questions panel. Uh, if you have any questions for the panelists at any time during the webinar, just type in your question there and that'll come in to Sarah and I on the back end and then we'll relay those questions to the presenters at the end of the webinar. And with that I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us again and thank you Ed for presenting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, and uh, thank you today to, for the EBM Tools Network and to Open Channels for hosting that webinar. And uh, thanks to everyone joining us today, um, especially those I can see uh, signed in from small island states, or as I think uh, we prefer to call them now, big ocean states. Um, today the webinar has got three speakers. I'm going to be the first, and we're going to be presenting on a basically on a paper we recently published in uh, the journal Frontiers in Marine Science. Uh, that paper is called Fostering Effective International Collaboration for Marine Science in Small Island States. And so in the introduction here, I'm just going to talk about structure of the paper and also how the idea for this, um, I guess not really research, but this opinion we formed um, came around. Um, so as I said, my name is Edward Hind. Um, until recently, I worked for an institution called the School for Field Studies, and I was based at the Center for Coastal Resource Management Studies in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, and there I worked, it was a, a study abroad provider, so American undergraduates were studying um, there, so I was lecturing them on environmental policy, um, but also we were performing original research in the Turks and Caicos on issues of marine policy, marine science, um, and also topics like food security in respect to seafood. Um, so that's kind of my background. And it was, this paper really started with my experience there. So in, in the Turks and Caicos, we actually had an agreement um, to work with, with, the, with the government and government institutions. So we worked alongside the De Department for Environment and Marine Affairs. And I can see Catherine is uh, logged in today from there. And so I've got a lot of experience of sort of collaborating as a foreign scientist living in a small island state um, with a, with a local scientific institution. Also in that role I saw there's a lot of scientists visiting the Turks and Caicos Islands, um, often from foreign nations. I saw lots of scientists come from the UK and the USA. Some of those were from uh, universities. Some of those were working for non-governmental organizations, environmental ones. Um, and I'd also, I'd often work with those. I'd often help facilitate their research or see how their research was facilitated within the country. Um, and I also saw occasionally bumped into other researchers who perhaps I didn't have that much contact with who were doing their own research in the Turks and Caicos. Um, and so seeing all those different different groups work together, different institutions, some academics, some not academics, some, some you know, local scientists from small island states and a lot of foreign scientists either living in the Turks and Caicos or visiting maybe for a period of research anything from one, one week to three months got me thinking a lot about how these collaborations work. Are these marine is this marine science as effective as it could be? And what I noticed watching all of these people and all these groups is everybody is doing things right. Um, but I also think a lot of people, I think everyone, including myself, is also making mistakes in how we go about doing marine science in small island states, specific, especially when we're collaborating with other institutions, whether they be local um, or overseas. Um, and maybe people are making mistakes, but maybe they're limited um, by other factors, and I'll come on to some of those um, as I go on. And so the question which kind of formed in my head is like, we've got all these great marine scientists doing all this research, but it's not always, you know, it's not always having the greatest impact for various reasons. And my question kind of was, how can we waste as little of this effort as possible? Um, so I took to Twitter, where I spend too much of my time. Um, and I contacted co colleagues, um, many of whom I was in contact uh, with over Twitter who worked in other small island states, 
I had a good few friends working in Jamaica and Barbados working on similar projects to I was in the Turks and Caicos. Um, and I also reached out to connections um, in sort of science, marine science institutions in small island states and also people working overseas who I knew researched a lot in small island states and asked them, do you think this is a problem? Do you think we're wasting a lot of the effort we're doing on marine science? Um, and there was a general there was a general feeling out there that collaborations could indeed be better um, and it wasn't it wasn't just me thinking this. Um, so the group of well the group of co-authors on this paper, which you can download there in the sidebar, um, we kind of got together and started to brainstorm how we could go about you know, kind of for formalizing what the limitations uh, might be and what some of the solutions to collaborating better uh, might be in these countries. So we looked at the literature out there. Uh, we're not the first people to write about this. Other academics have written about this before, especially in the Caribbean. But there's also some big policy documents out there. So last year was the year, well, 2014 was the year of a small island developing state uh, with the United Nations. And so out of the conference they had in Samoa came the UN Samoa pathway, which has a lot of information on how scientific collaboration should work in small island states in the future. And there's also statements out there on research integrity, how we should best do research when we're collaborating. Um, so if you look at one of the footnotes there in the paper um, that you may have downloaded or may have open now, there's a link to the Montreal statement. And that's a great place for anyone working on the research collaboration um, to start. Um, and so we decided to build on some of these broad statements, um, but also start to form our own ideas. So what we did was we organized a symposium uh, another conference at the International Marine Conservation Congress in, in uh, Glasgow in 2015 um, and at that, sorry, in 2014 and at that conference uh, four of us spoke. Uh, we, represent, we presented case studies from the Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, Cuba and the Maldives. Uh, Jake, who's going to speak later, was one of those speakers on, on that day speaking about Cuba and he's going to speak about, um, he's going to give that case study again. And also we had an audience of 50 to 60 researchers in the room probably 80% of whom were um, what we call foreign scientists working in small island states, but it was also five to 10 delegates um, who tended, who were working um, for scientific institutions in small island states, and, and they were natives of those small island states. And at the end of the four presentations, we had about a 45 minute floor debate where everyone gave a lot of ideas out for how we could improve these scientific collaborations um, so that they're most effective. And all those, a lot of those ideas have been synthesized and put into this paper um, that we're presenting today. Um, if you want to kind of have a review of what happened on that day, there's actually a hashtag on Twitter. It's hashtag and then SIDS, so S-I-D-S and then M-A-R-S-C-I, so hashtag SIDS Marsai. And you'll be able to see a lot of the floor debate um, which happened on that day. So if I just move um, swiftly on, I'm just going to now outline kind of what we came up with in the paper as a whole. So in our, in our paper we ended up, we took all the comments we got and we, we presented that we synthesized those comments under four different themes. We used coding and it seemed that four things were coming up over and over again. Um, and the first of those was um, that when people are researching in, in these collaborations in small island states, we're not always aligning priorities. Um, so external research, you know, it definitely definitely has a role um, in small island states, but it's not okay just to come in necessarily with your own personal agenda. Well, when you're working in small island state, you're working under a different um, a different framework. You might be in a nation that you're from, especially if you're a foreign a foreign researcher from a much larger state. And so, what we say in the paper that new ideas are fine. It, might, it is really important to try and address address local priority needs. Um, and those those research needs, um, so basically your personal research needs should perhaps be lower, your personal research interests should perhaps be lower um, lower in your research than they normally would be. And we, we, we put forward in the paper that one of the ways to try um, and identify what these needs might be in a country is to use a few various techniques. So you're going to have to use techniques like um, stakeholder facilitation where you hold workshops with local scientists. Um, and local scientists should be trying to, any when they get contacted by foreign researchers who want to work in the small island state, they should be trying to set up um, these workshops as well, where it's kind of thrashed out what the priorities are. And so, if you just bear with me one second, sorry. So we also we also look um, SWOT analysis. So in these workshops, start start to look for strengths within a country, weaknesses, 
um, that can be identified um, and where, where new research can be prioritized. The second thing we present in the paper and say is a theme that should be addressed, sorry, I'm just getting lost in my notes here, is um, it's really important to build long-term relationships. So actually, if you look at the UN documents, the UN actually asks for these. It's preferable to have one-off, you know, not to have one-off glamour projects um, if such projects no, have no long-term impacts. Um, what we should really be looking to do with in international collaborations is to build long-term impact. So it's better maybe to contribute perhaps to local long-term data, set, data sets. Um, and one of the best ways to do this is to co-produce research. And not only should these data sets be built, like these, these are data sets which when they're established, um, they should also be able to you know, be carried on by scientists um, once funding has been removed. Um, one of the things which we found when we were writing this paper is it was said, it's, how do you establish these long-term relationships? in small island states, because they are very different to the states foreign researchers often come from. And so it's actually, you ha what we would say is it's much easier to actually make an impact. One of the great things for me about working with Turks and Caicos is, which I could never do in the UK where I live now, is I was actually able to phone up you know, the, the head of the Department of Environment and discuss you know, what we could collaborate on today. That's an opportunity most of us in this call don't normally have, but you, know, you need to find out these these networks if you're working in the small island state. It's going to allow you to have much greater impact. And even for young career scientists, there's programs out there like the US Fulbright program, which actually will um, provide a mentor for you, mentor scientists from that small island state. This has happened recently in Jamaica, where those scientists, even if you're just a postgraduate student, for instance, you can make an impact in the country you're working with um, if, if you make such relationships. So do take opportunity. Um, do, you to, do take opportunities to network and make sure you contact people on the ground before you start researching. So the third, the third thing we, looked at, um, we highlight as a theme is the enhancing of local capacity. Nicola and Jake are going to talk about this a lot in their case studies of the Bahamas and Cuba. So I won't go into too much detail, but again, I'll re-emphasize that long-term data, um, long-term large data sets which we can make decisions on are much better the expensive equipment which can't be maintained beyond the life of a project. Um, any initiative which um, encourages training is great. One of the things we hi highlight in the paper here is that citizen science programs are becoming very big in countries um, like the Bahamas and these are really good things to build um, because you're not just training the scientists of, of now but you're training the scientists of the future. So getting a lot of, when you're doing your research, try and involve a lot of young people as well and get them involved in data collection that's going to help you build long-term capacity. Um, just coming towards the end here, the last theme we highlight is um, the sharing of research products. And the one thing I think is really important to remember is so much research in the past, which has happened in small island states, conducted by foreign scientists, has ended up sitting on a shelf or in a pay-per-view journal. Um, what would really help is if, when you think about, when you think of plan your research, if you plan to collect data together, to analyze data together, and to publish to get data together. This way, everyone working in a collaboration um, is going to have joint comprehension of everything, everything which has gone on. And, the re and I guess the, the reason this is so important, these, the reason why we're really focused, just to summarize, why we're really focusing on collaboration um, in, sm in small island states, why is this such an important topic, why are we not talking about collaboration across the world, is because it really is like, for, for those of you who've worked on the ground it, you know, in, in these countries, you realize that you know, it's it is almost too late. The and the great you know, there's a lot of biodiversity in these countries, but there's not always the capacity in these countries um, to to deal with this at the moment. Uh, to deal with conserving this biodiversity, the long term goal is that um, each region, the Pacific, the Indo Pacific, um, and the Caribbean will have it. You know, there'll be enough scientists in these regions to conduct this research and to get the um, conservation outcomes we need. But at the moment, the United Nations has highlighted that this is impossible and that this must come from international collaborations, at least for the next 20 years. In the face of the environmental shocks, which are climate change, are ocean acidification, are overfishing, um, which, you know, the impacts are higher in small island states for all of these things than they are for in most states. So it's really, you know, it's really important to get towards solutions. And we put forward a case in this paper but that's best done through international collaborations. And hopefully in the question section, session at the end, we'll be able to look at, um, we'll be able to hear some of your ideas, but one idea we put forward, um, which we'd like to take forward in the conclusion of our paper, 
is it's probably time to start setting up um, some sort of database of where there's where there's research prior a sort of research priorities database um, highlights so scientists from small island nations can log on to that database and say you know we need help priority in this area we don't have the capacity to complete this at the moment and so instead of just conducting research at random foreign scientists um, can log on to this database look at where there might be research need and start to see if they have the skills um, um, the skills and the capacity to help out in um, certain scenarios um, so I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there for now I'm happy to answer any questions at the end uh, but now I'd like to hand over to one of the co-authors on the paper. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Nicola Smith, um, who, when, when I first started contacting Nicola, she was working um, for the Bahamas Department of uh, Marine Resources, but now she's a PhD student in Canada at Simon Fraser University. Um, and so um, I'll, let, I'll let her introduce her project. Thanks very much. Uh, Nicola, you should be presenter now if you want to pull up your PowerPoint. Perfect. Oh, sure. Hi, so everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about an international collaboration in the Bahamas, which I led in 2010. The project involved both local and foreign organizers, uh, organizations working together on the ground to determine methods to control invasive lionfish in priority areas. During my talk, I will highlight three of the general recommendations for effective international collaboration that Ed just talked about. Start with a bit of background information. The Bahamas is an archipelago of over 700 islands located just east of Florida and north of Cuba. It is also my home country. Tourism is our primary industry, accounting for about 50% of GDP, while our population is relatively small at just over 350,000 people. The Bahamas faces many threats to marine ecosystems, including the usual suspects, that is, climate change, overfishing, coastal pollution, um, coastal development pollution, and invasive species. However, like many small island states, we have a limited capacity to adequately address these threats. For example, there are only a handful of marine field stations in the Bahamas with varying levels of infrastructure. Furthermore, these stations largely cater to students from foreign universities. It is also important to note that there is currently no National University of the Bahamas. We only have the College of the Bahamas, which caters primarily to undergraduates. Although the college, uh, although the goal is the college of the college is to transition into university status within the coming years. Now, universities are hubs for both basic and applied research. The lack of a national university therefore means that it is often necessary for the Bahamas to partner with foreign institutions in order to adequately address pressing environmental issues. The recent invasion of Indo-Pacific lionfish in the Western Atlantic Ocean is a case in point. The lionfish are coral reef fish native to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, but were introduced to the Western Atlantic in the mid-1980s. However, lionfish were not reported in the Bahamas until 2004. Since then, lionfish have become established along the U.S. eastern seaboard, the Gulf of Mexico, and throughout most of the Caribbean. They eat smaller fish and crustaceans and pose a major threat to marine ecosystems, in which lionfish have already reduced native prey fish abundances on large tracts of coral reefs in the Bahamas by up to 65%. Currently, the only effective means of controlling the spread of lionfish is by manual removal by divers. In 2008, in response to the invasion, representatives from 16 local stakeholder organizations in the Bahamas came together in a management planning workshop. One of the outcomes of, from this workshop was the recognition for the need for foreign institutions to assist with the financial and technical aspects of lionfish research. In 2009, the Bahamian government therefore applied for and received a grant from the Global Environment Facility through the United Nations Environment Program and the Center for Agriculture and Biosciences International to develop a pilot project for the control of lionfish. Now, this project was part of a much wider Caribbean initiative called Mitigating the Threats of Invasive Alien Species in the Insular Caribbean. Now, there are several components to the Bahamas pilot project, but I'm only going to talk today about one, which was the lionfish control field experiment in which I was the coordinator. Now, this experiment took place on four different islands in three different habitat types over a period of two years. The Bahamas Department of Marine Resources was the lead implementing organization 
and worked in collaboration with five local and two foreign organizations based in the USA and Canada. Now, for this project, we had three general goals. First, to determine the impacts of lionfish in mangrove creeks, coral reefs, and nearshore areas. Second, to determine the lionfish removal frequency needed to mitigate these impacts. And third, to build national capacity in reef fish monitoring um, and lionfish control. Now, given the large number of organizations involved with this project, it was critical that both local and foreign research priorities were aligned. As I previously stated, through various stakeholder meetings, the Bahamas identified the lionfish invasion as a national research priority and subsequently received funding from an international body to support work in this area. With an understanding of shared local expectations, I was therefore able, as a coordinator, to draft a set of research objectives and recruit foreign collaborators who are already actively involved in lionfish research and training in the Caribbean. Now, because the Bahamas had explicit research priorities, and these priorities were shared with our foreign collaborators, we were able to conduct a, um, research at a pace and on a spatial scale that none of us have been, have been able to accomplish if we were acting alone. Now, one of the greatest strengths, I think, of our project was the considerable time and financial investment we placed in enhancing capacity within existing local research communities. Because this was an explicit goal of our project, time and resources were set aside to accomplish four things. First, to identify local training needs. And this was done through consultation with the many uh, different partner organizations in the Bahamas that we were working with. Second, was to conduct training workshops that gradually built skills in three phases over a year. Third, was to conduct monthly proficiency dives for one year to reinforce recently acquired skills. And fourth, was to undergo formal testing to attain international certification in reef fish identification, which qualifies project participants to subsequently teach fish ID to others within the region. So therefore, the trainees become the trainers by the end of our project. Now, one of the most telling indicators of the success of our training program, and the one that I am most proud of, was that local scientists went on to use many of the skills that they acquired from our project on many of the other local projects that they were working on. Now, lastly, I want to talk briefly about the value of building long-term relationships from a personal perspective. As a result of the strong personal relationships and considerable social networks established during our pilot project, I went on to lead two other international collaborations with some of our local and foreign partners. In one of these projects, I continue to focus on the lionfish invasion in the Bahamas, but in my new role as a PhD student. And the great thing about this is that a lot of the contacts that I had made while I was conducting the, uh, the lionfish uh, project with the Bahamas in terms of some of the local NGOs as well as some of the local government agencies. They were pleased with the work, we were pleased with our relationship, and then they went on to further support uh, my PhD research, uh, which I basically went on and became a student of one of the foreign universities that was our collaborator on the project. So that worked out incredibly well, and now we're five years in um, to another project. And I would also point out that a second collaboration was started as a result of the strong social network and personal relationships formed on this lionfish project. And this second collaboration goes beyond lionfish and capitalizes on the trust and familiarity acquired during our project to force research in a new direction that examines the extent of unreported fisheries catch in the Bahamas over the past half century and its implications for effective management and conservation. And uh, undertaking a project like this was only possible due to that strong, um, a strong personal relationships that uh, was achieved during the lionfish project. And as Ed said earlier, the great thing about it was, yes, working in these small island states like the Bahamas, I was able to just pick up the phone and call the director of marine resources and say, hey, I have some questions about how fishery data is collected in the Bahamas. Can you help me with this? And that was made possible because of these long-term relationships that was established on the, on the previous project. And so on that positive note for a change in marine conservation, I'd like to turn it now over to Jake. Thank you.
Jake, you should have the presenter seat now. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's coming through. Excellent. Um, well, great. Well, um, uh, thank you, uh, Nick, um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, my name is Jake Kreitzer. I'm a marine scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm based in our Boston office, but my work uh, focuses on um, countries across the globe. Uh, today I'm going to take us a little bit south of Nicola's stomping grounds in the Bahamas and, and talk about some of our work in Cuba. Um, and what, whereas Nicola sort of really drilled down into this very specific problem, although a certainly complex and wide-ranging problem of the lionfish invasion, I'm going to give more of a high-level overview of EDF's work in Cuba. And, and that work spans um, scientific research, but also policy and governance research, um, as, as well as implementation of all that research hand-in-hand -hand with our Cuban partners. Uh, but first, I'd like to give a little overview of, of Cuba for those who might not be too familiar with the country. Um, I've been really fortunate to work there these last few years, and, and have found it to be um, an incredibly beautiful, um, incredibly complex, um, and also a very warm place. And I mean warm not only in terms of its climate, uh, but also its people. I've, I've felt nothing but um, um, welcoming affection from, from the partners we had in Cuba. Um, Cuba is the largest island in the Caribbean by far, and it's also the 17th largest island in the world. So arguably, we're not really looking at a small island state here, although I think many of the uh, challenges and opportunities that we try to address in our paper uh, certainly apply to Cuba as they do to other places. Um, its, its geographic positioning um, is, is unique and important. It sits at the nexus of the Western Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean Sea. So it's sort of the hub of three of the largest and most significant marine systems um, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and it's also a global reservoir of biodiversity. So the, the environmental of importance of Cuba simply cannot be overstated. Now, I could never hope to do justice to conveying um, the breadth of environmental challenges that are being faced in Cuba um, and, and the equally important uh, progress that um, Cuba has made um, in, in, in addressing these challenges and the ingenuity that Cuba has made in showing them. But I'm going to try to give some highlights. Um, and similarly, you know, EDF has been working in Cuba for more than 15 years now. Our work has spanned a range of issues and involved many people, and I could uh, never do justice to everything um, uh, we've done there and, and the challenges we've faced. But um, my aim is going to be to highlight some of the principles in the paper that were outlined by Ed and, and further illustrated by Nicola. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, I want to show two graphs. Um, this first one, which I hope has popped up, um, is taken from a report by Dr. Julio Baisra. Uh, Dr. Baisra is in many ways the godfather of fishery science in Cuba, someone I've learned um, quite a bit from in the time I've gotten to know him. Uh, he had a fellowship from the UN a few years back to study in Iceland and, and produced an incredibly useful report on the history and, and contemporary management of Cuban fisheries. And, and this figure shows the historical trend in fisheries catch in Cuba. Um, and, it, and it shows some really striking and important patterns. You can see that not long after the Cuban Revolution, um, which led to the onset of a much closer partnership with the Soviet Union, there, there was a dramatic increase, um, basically from nothing to more than half of Cuban fisheries catch um, coming from other countries' EEZs and the high seas. And, and that was made possible by Soviet subsidies allowing development of, of a large-scale distant water industrial fishing fleet and Soviet markets being a place to take in all that product. Um, and, and that really became a, a hugely important part of Cuban fisheries for many years. But following the breakup of the Soviet Union, that all came to a close, that that fleet um, simply was no longer economically viable without that relationship with the Soviet Union. Um, and so very quickly, that distant water catch went away. Now, what this figure doesn't really fully show, though, is that that meant a considerable influx of fishermen back into the nearshore, smaller scale coastal fisheries that had for long, for, for centuries, been the backbone of, of, of fishing in Cuba. Um, so this was, a, this was a new and important challenge that, that came about with that, that very global historical change. Um, now, one of the ways that Cuba um, endeavored to respond to that challenge was by implementing what I've found to be one of the most ambitious policies anywhere for um, implementation of marine protected areas. 
the, the, the goal in Cuba is to have 25% of its insular shelf within MPAs, and I think they're nearly at that target now ahead of schedule. Um, so this figure kind of shows the trend in implementation of MPAs as well as some related spatial management and zoning tools um, in practice in Cuba. And, and you can see that, that not long after um, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the end of that relationship, there was a rapid increase in implementation um, of MPAs. But what this figure doesn't show is that implementation of MPAs in Cuba, like in many places, um, has been fraught with challenges in terms of the nature of consultative and participatory decision making, uh, management, enforcement, and capacity, and certainly the scientific information needed for sound design and evaluation. Uh, last year, I published a book chapter um, alongside uh, Dr. Fabian Pina and several other authors from across the world. Uh, Fabian and I are pictured in the two um, photos up on this slide. And Fabian is the uh, director of Cuba's Center for Coastal Ecosystems Research. Um, he's also a co-author on the paper we're discussing today, um, and he's become a really good friend and important scientific colleague. And our paper focused on the, the different approaches taken to try to implement ecosystem-based management in coral reefs and other nearshore tropical habitats across the globe. And we used Cuba as a case study. And, and we made some important arguments, I think. Um, one I, is the one I just made in the previous slide, that while Cuba's MPA policy is a critical component, arguably the backbone of its MPA framework, um, that in order to be effective, we're really going to need to meet these decision-making, management, and scientific challenges. Um, but the second point, which is arguably more important, is that as ambitious as this policy to have 25% of Cuban waters in MPAs might be, that still leaves 75% of Cuban waters um, open. And, and therefore, there were some big challenges to be faced in terms of uh, improving fishery science, improving fisheries management, um, and really understanding and mediating the conflicts among fisheries and other resource users. Um, and, and so I think the work um, Fabian and I did together in producing this chapter illustrates both alignment of priorities, um, the beginning of what I hope will be a long-term relationship between the two of us, um, and, and, and sharing uh, scientific products. Now, I, I don't want to give the impression that the ideas Fabian and I put forward in that, in that chapter, along with our co-authors, were, were something new, that, that Cuban, um, many Cuban stakeholders and, and my colleagues at EDF have been aware of these challenges for a while. And, and on this slide, I've illustrated two products, um, I think, that further illustrate the alignment of priorities between my organization and, and our partners in Cuba and, and the building of long-term relationships. So on the left is the cover page from a 2004 report that um, EDF put out alongside the World Wildlife Fund and Cuba's National Center for Protected Areas. And, and it tries to give some legal policy governance and scientific guidance for um, implementing and developing Cuba's MPA network. Um, that was fairly early on in our, in our engagements in Cuba. Much more recently, only about a month or so ago, um, the, the document uh, depicted on the right, so this is the cover for Cuba's National Plan of Action for Conservation of Sharks um, that was very recently released and submitted to the UN and approved by the UN um, has been finalized. Now, one thing you'll notice right away is that the list of partners at the bottom of the cover page has grown substantially. Um, and, and I think that reflects um, sort of the evolution of, of partnerships uh, within Cuba and between Cuba and the U.S. So um, now the collaboration involves a range of Cuban agencies as well as overseas organizations in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, part of that was necessitated by the fact that the National Plan of Action is a, covers a much wider range of issues. So it's MPAs are embedded within here, but there's also fisheries management, there's tourism value and management of tourism activities, there's user conflicts between tourism and fisheries, um, and, and certainly a, a scientific research agenda. Um, but I think, so, so to me, these two products are sort of emblematic of our efforts to align our organizational priorities um, with the needs in Cuba, and, and you know, these, these products span more than a decade, so I think reflect the building and, and sustaining of long-term relationships. Now, about two years ago, um, at the request of and in partnership with the Cuban Fisheries Department, EDF ran a workshop in Cuba um, on the 
use of different kinds of data limited tools for fishery stock assessment. And one of the tools that we considered um, in that workshop is something called Productivity Susceptibility Analysis, or PSA. Um, what PSA tries to do is evaluate the inherent vulnerability of a fish stock as a function of its biological productivity and the nature of its interactions with fisheries or, or its susceptibility. Um, now, as we discuss this tool as, as one of many covered in that workshop, uh, Dr. Elisa Garcia, who is a really important leader in Cuba, she's the director of their fisheries department, she recognized the potential value of this tool for revising fisheries policy in Cuba, prioritizing resources for monitoring and stock assessment, and possibly even implementing precautionary measures um, in the near term for the most at-risk species. So, um, at Dr. Garcia's request, uh, Dr. Rafa Pugo, who is one of the most senior fisheries scientists in Cuba and also happens to be Elisa's husband, um, began leading a team comprised of a range of Cuban stakeholders as well as uh, myself and a few colleagues at EDF in developing a national scale PSA um, for the country. And, and what I've depicted here is actually an outgrowth of that effort. This is a PSA um, solely um, focused on the shark and ray species in Cuba. And, and, and this, act, this output here represented um, an implementation of the recommendations of the National Plan of Action before it was even finalized. Um, so, so this again, I think, is an example of um, sharing the research outputs and, and doing so in a way that we're hoping is enhancing local capacity. So this is my final slide. I want to talk briefly about another workshop we held about a year ago. Um, this one was held um, not far from where I live um, on Cape Cod at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And, and this workshop brought together um, a diverse array of Cuban partners um, as well as science, management, and industry leaders um, here in New England. Um, and a few of our colleagues from Mexico. And our focus in this workshop was trying to figure out ways to better um, integrate spatial tools with fishery science and fisheries management um, in terms of habitat protection, in terms of improving stock productivity, uh, increasing scientific understanding, managing user conflicts, um, aligning user incentives. So a wide range of outcomes focused on not only MPAs, but other sorts of spatial tools. And, and to sort of tee up the discussions in that workshop, we had a series of presentations by uh, some of the US, Cuban, and Mexican participants. And, and here I've shown Dr. Garcia giving her talk, um, which among other things touched upon how Cuba integrates spatial management, um, planning, and implementation with its fisheries management. And, and I think in the course of her talk, um, it really opened up several of the US participants' eyes to how much more integrated um, the approaches in Cuba compared to the, frankly, quite scattered and disconnected governance uh, framework we have in place in the U.S., at least as it comes to, when it comes to spatial management. Um, and, 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 and it really, I think, compelled several of the U.S. participants to start thinking about both the inefficiencies and deficiencies in, in our own policy architecture. Um, so my closing point here is an important one. This was an example, I think, of enhancing local capacity. Um, but this was being held in Massachusetts. So the local capacity here was ours in the US. And, and Elisa was bringing some very important lessons about the approaches Cuba has used, the successes it's enjoyed, and the challenges it's faced um, that I think helped my colleagues here in the US think differently about what we're doing and what we might need to do differently. Um, so the point there is that, is that many of the potential benefits to be had from these collaborations with um, scientists and other stakeholders in these developing island states, um, those benefits need to be viewed in a very bi-directional way. And we need to, those of us in places like the US need to go into these places um, looking for lessons to learn, not just for lessons to deliver. And I'll stop there, Nick. Awesome, thank you all so much for that. Uh, so just a quick housekeeping note, uh, if you click on the little uh, orangish red arrow in the top right hand corner of your screen, uh, that'll bring out the GoToWebinar control panel. And with that, you can uh, go to the questions pane there and just type in any questions you have for our panelists. Uh, Jake, do you want me to stop sharing your screen then? I can take that back. Sure, do you want, or do you want me to leave something up? Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, if you want to leave something up, that's fine. Okay. Um, I'll just go to our closing slide.
Okay, let's see, I don't have any questions yet. Um, oh, I also just wanted to point out the, the handouts panel. Uh, you can download a copy of the paper and the supplementary template for the Memorandum of Understanding there as well. Um, is there anything you guys want to elaborate on while we have some extra time? Yeah, while we, while we wait for, for questions, Nick, I was just going to say I realized I forgot to advance some of my slides there during my talk, and there was a few things I wanted to highlight in the paper. We didn't, um, well, well, a lot of, well, the main body of the paper is kind of this theoretical framework for how collaborations might be improved. Um, during, the, during the symposium we held at the, the Third International Marine Conservation Congress, there was a lot of very specific inputs from the floor. Um, from the scientists and the NGO workers, etc., who are present, and actually in the in the paper, if you look at Table One, you'll find some very tailored advice, some more specific advice, like actionable advice on how how you can start to make collaborations better now. And uh, Jake Jake's little closing point there actually uh, reminded me of one of them. Um, so, for instance, one of one of the points is, you know, it's, it's a point addressed towards funders as well as to scientists, and it's to say that. Um, one one of the, one of the problems with our own symposium was there was only about five to ten scientists there from small island states. How can how can we have collaborations if we have two, I guess two different rooms of scientists who don't have the mechanisms always to collaborate? So funders potentially and scientists who have access to funding should be able, like what Jake's EDF there hosting a workshop in in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, funders should be looking to provide you know funding so that scientists from small island states can travel to international conferences where marine policy, where marine science, um, et cetera, is discussed. So that should be something put aside for in funding. If you're going to fund a project which sends foreign scientists to a small island state, make sure you also put funding in there so that small island state scientists can collaborate fully in, in, you know, in that collaboration so they can go to conferences overseas um, and potentially also attend these workshops like, like Jake's there. So and and the, you, other, the other, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. And the other thing I forgot to highlight, which was going to be on my final slide, is that we actually uh, another another piece of another tool we might another tool you might find helpful if you're listening to this webinar is we actually the, one of the supplement the supplement from the paper is actually an example of a memorandum of understanding, so a way of formalising these collaborations, which actually one of the co-authors has set up. He's he, he's a he's a co-author working in a you know in a not not in a small island state who works regularly in one. I can't I can't name the state here because. The document. Uh, we don't uh, reveal exactly which country the document comes from, but he's adapted the framework he has with that country, with their permission, as a download here. So it's a, it's a document you can use as a as a basis for scientific collaborations in small island states. It's a it's a memorandum of understanding, and you can adapt it if you want. You don't have to use obviously what we've said. So Ed, you mentioned you spend a lot of time on Twitter. Have you found that social media has helped uh, build relationships with? People in small island, small island developing states while you're abroad. Um, I, I, I think definitely. I think um, I think there's seven authors on the paper, and five of them are people I met for the first time over Twitter or, or through those people. So, I, in fact, I don't. I think I think the people I hadn't met any of the co-authors on the paper until we turned up at the symposium last year, and I haven't seen many of them since. So, I mean, this is how this has helped us collaborate on this on this paper. But I'm, I think it's just observe having you know being. Having myself lived in the Turks and Caicos for three years and not having necessarily the funding to travel to lots of international conferences myself, it was one of the ways I stayed in contact with other marine scientists around the world. And I can imagine it was a very useful tool for me. Um, one, one thing I did when I was on Twitter in the Turks and Caicos is we managed to collaborate with, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's called the Catlin Seaview Survey. You may also know it as kind of Google Oceans. And I saw that they were coming to do surveys of the reefs in the Turks and Caicos, and I was like, well, is you know, is there is there anything we can do to help you out while you're here? I just sent them a tweet, and then they ended up. Um, not only did they end up taking a lot of our advice on where to do those surveys of coral reefs, um, but one of their staff gave a talk to our students and to the local and to the local um, scientists from the Turks and Caicos. So we actually managed, um, you know, on on what they were doing and how it, how the products they were producing might be useful. And for scientists based in a country like the Turks and Caicos, so that was a that was a collaboration which came about this paper and that example I've given there are both collaborations which would never have happened without Twitter. Yeah, and for me, um, when I was living in the Bahamas for quite a quite a well most of my life, is that 
a lot of times I wasn't able to attend international conferences, but you know, because people are live tweeting now for a lot of conferences, and so I would actually follow along by following the live tweets. And so it was kind of my way of being able to participate in a conference, although not physically being in the room. And so I feel like Twitter has definitely made scientists, particularly in small island states, feel more connected to the international research com uh, community, um, particularly in conferences that they otherwise wouldn't have access to attending. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we have a question here, um, Ed, I think this is primarily directed at you, but obviously the rest of you should all chime in as well. Um, how can those of us who aren't in small island states be involved with either citizen science or have an impact in this area of research and collaboration? Um, specifically within small island states, or does, does, it, does the question specify? Uh, yeah, so especially specifies uh, helping out with citizen science or research and collaboration in small island states when you're not in one of those areas. I think a lot of, while well, you can't necessarily um, like become like become part of a project in a small island state itself remotely. There's lots of projects which, um, which which would help. For instance, there's the I don't know if anyone's heard of eBird. It's one of the biggest citizen science applications in the world. Anyone can sign up and with a bit of trick, with a bit of you know basic you know basic birding guide, you can go out and um, take part you know take part in birding on a daily basis. And those that data you upload is then shared with scientists globally, most of them based at Cornell University in the US, and they write scientific papers from that. And one thing I saw when I was in the Turks and Caicos, like, I used that with my students, the American undergraduates I was supervising, so we were uploading data. Um, the National Department of Environment, they were uploading their data, so that was two institutions in the Turks and Caicos loading data up into this global database of birds. But the other interesting thing is that tourists coming through on cruise ships or just staying for a week, you know, they would actually, they, they'd have an eBird account which they use when they're at home in America or the UK or wherever. And when they came to Turks and Caicos, they'd actually collect data um, while they were on holiday, because some people are like that, which um, they, they, they would upload to these international databases. So even if, even if you're only in a small island state for a week, or for a day, you know, you can you, you can you can take part in collecting that data. But equally, as of you know, if you lived in a small island state on a, a permanent basis, when you went on holiday to the UK or the US or to a conference, you you could collect data there as well. It's a it's a two way tool. It's uh, I think those, if you want to find out more projects like that, one of the best places is to start with uh, Scientific American. If you go to their website, you'll find a whole database of um, pretty much every citizen science project in the world, which you can search for topics, of interests, and countries in which it is active. Yeah, and the marine equivalent to what I just talked about is actually the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. They have a, uh, it's a huge uh, diver sort of website where people that do recreational diving all over the world will actually log the different species of fish that they see on their dives and the dive sites. And that is done not just in the Caribbean, it's done in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, basically throughout the world. And so if you're on vacation in small island states, you can... Um, conduct these fish surveys, or even if you're just sitting around in California or in your home, you can actually conduct those surveys and contribute to this global database, which also contributes to, to huge research papers that are used by universities and NGOs and government organizations, basically anyone interested in environmental work and marine research uh, kind of use that database. Awesome. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, how do you work through different languages and varying cultural importance of MPAs and ocean resources among small island states? Okay, I, I'll jump in on that one because a comment I, I wanted to make um, was that when, when I gave my talk in, in the Glasgow Symposium, I had one, maybe even two slides about, uh, you know, about all of the important um, um, issues, complexities, et cetera, that were wrapped up in the U.S.-Cuba relationship and how, you know, how this might make uh, this a case study that's not widely applicable. Well, you'll, you'll notice none of that was in there today, and I think it's because in participating in that symposium and, and developing this paper since, um, I've, I've learned that, yes, those things exist, and, and maybe those kinds of complexities are on steroids in, in something like the U.S.-Cuba relationship, but, but they exist, you know, anywhere between any any two nations and, and people coming together from those nations, there's going to be some degree of political, cultural, economic um, differences, complexities, et cetera. Um, that, that doesn't answer the question, I know. Um, 
it's um, I, there's it's, it's a it's a big and complex question, and there's there's a lot of um, a lot of ways to try to navigate those differences. I think I think one really important point is not to assume um, that the that that everyone from either country coming together is going to think the same way. I've, I've met um, Cubans that I think much more in a much more similar way with than, than some of my American colleagues. And um, so, so a lot of the perspectives on um, something like MPAs, the, the role, the importance, uh, the performance of MPAs can boil down to individual perspectives. Um, you know, there, that, that's not to completely dismiss the importance of um, of kind of attitudes and perspectives that, that operate more at the national scale. Um, and, and I think the answer really is just as simple as, um, you know, FaceTime. Um, these, that, that, that's why the, the, the recommendation about building longstanding relationships is important. Um, and, and I think maybe to add to that, um, something that was, I think, critical to EDF's um, ability to work successfully in Cuba was really easing our way in. That, that in the early years, I think our first um, our first foray by by EDF staff into Cuba happened around 2000, and it was simply to attend a conference, meet people, hear talks, start to get the lay of the land, starting to build relationships without really trying to quote unquote do anything, um, and and eventually it was just simply that relationship building that started to align not just priorities but perspectives and and lead to um, you know, requests from different different stakeholders in Cuba, scientists, managers, et cetera, for support, collaboration, advice. Um, and so it was really taking the time to understand one another, um, start to incorporate the other's perspectives into how we think and act, um, and, and after doing that for a while, starting to engage in sort of joint research, education, or other efforts. Can I perhaps... Um I just build quickly on what Jake said there with perhaps a more sort of micro example is I, and why I think it is really important to build these local uh, local long-term relationships and have local collaborations is um, you know things which might be I think if, in terms of learning cultural differences certainly one of the ones which is very common um, a common area of I guess controversy in the in the Caribbean is um, sea turtles which are a very important part of diet on um, some Caribbean islands and if you haven't done if you haven't, you know, if you make a, if you're a foreign researcher coming in and you, you know, you talk to a foreign scientist or a foreign environmental agency in advance, you know, you'll be you'll be made aware of these things, um, and you know, it's it's, it's a two-way knowledge sharing. It's you know, people sharing knowledge with you about their country and you sharing, you know, knowledge about your country and each other's science. But if, you, if I've seen people come in without talking to local scientists and immediately start talking to fishermen on the dock saying, you know, you shouldn't be catching that sea turtle, it's important to the ecosystem. But if, if you do that as a researcher coming in, you you often, you immediately use your credibility with a lot of the people you might want to do research with. Um, you, you can cause offense very quickly, and once you've caused offense, it can be very difficult for you or any other foreign researcher who comes after you um, to do any research in that country. That's what you have to be very careful about is not is not burning bridges which become vital for research. Most of the very high profile research which has been done in the Turtles and Caicos by foreign scientists is on sea turtles and fortunately a lot of it is very good because they collaborated very closely, not just with the local Department of Environment but also with the local fishermen's organizations. And so it's not just about learning from scientific agencies, it's also about learning from local community, uh, local community groups and institutions. So real quick question, do you guys have anything planned for the next IMCC? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I think uh, it's good to, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm sure some people do, um, but um, in terms of, I think we're, we're looking at sort of the reaction to this opinion paper at the moment, um, certainly I've received a few emails, um, and the, the planning for the next IMCC is already well underway. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something at the IMCC in three years, but obviously we'd like to uh, take action before that. But I think a lot of this debate has moved online now and into into other angles. I think we've got we've crowdsourced a lot of opinion. We want to crowdsource some more, hopefully, through responses to this paper um, and papers which and any, any work which cites this paper, and then look at some of those long-term solutions which we talk about in the conclusion. I know I know there's other groups out there doing the same. Um, if you look at the outputs of the SIDS 2014 conference, the UN conference, 
um, there's some really good working papers on how science and scientific collaborations need to improve. So I'd encourage anyone uh, to read those and you'll see who the main players in this field are. And we have another question here. Um, uh, do you have a perspective on how NOAA is doing in conducting conservation research within our own jurisdictional holdings of small islands, island states like Puerto Rico or Guam? Might be a question for Jake. As the oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, suppose, I suppose that one's on me. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the short answer is I, I, not sure, um, to be honest, that, that my, um, my work in the U.S. has been heavily focused on New England. Um, I, I do have, I, I have some perspective on that through, um, you know, I'm, I'm involved with our Regional Fishery Management Council in, in New England, and, and every, every year that we have a um, scientific workshop that brings together scientific advisors from the various um, um, regions to sort of compare notes. And some of the things you hear from um, the Caribbean and the Western, um, the Western Pacific regions, which are which are where those U.S. holdings sit, um, are, are probably not surprising that we have a, um, a, you know, I think we have a fairly strong fisheries law in the U.S., but it does put um, a somewhat high demand on, on the quantity and quality of science. And, um, and, and in those, um, those sorts of places, which have much more high diversity fisheries than what we deal with um, in, in the northern temperate latitudes, um, that just getting the, the basic information on, on the status and life history of some of these fish stocks, let alone, um, let alone converting that into, you know, running that through population models and converting that into um, kind of defensible catch limits is a big challenge. Um, I think NOAA, to its credit, has been, a lot of that policy, I think, was, was established based on successes and, and failures in, in places like New England and Alaska. Um, um, and I think NOAA, to its credit, is working hard to figure out how to to better implement that policy in, in some of the um, more data limited and high diversity regions. Um, and, and I think that is, in some ways, really influencing the the increasing um, and, and evolving conversation about ecosystem based management. Um, because there's there's tools in the ecosystem based management toolbox that that might help us do better in managing those um, those high diversity and, and and data limited situations. So um, so I I, I I think that that the challenges are probably not surprising, and from what I've seen, NOAA is um, is moving in the right directions and and alongside a variety of academic NGO and industry partners to try to meet those challenges. I, th I think there's a good broader point from this question as well, not just specific to NOAA. I mean, I was working in the Turks and Caicos Islands as an English um, overseas scientist in, in the Turks and Caicos, which is a UK overseas territory. So there's some, uh, many of the small island states that are not uh, fully, in, fully independent, um, for, for better or for worse. But even, even in the Turks and Caicos, you don't actually see, I don't actually see on a day-to-day -day basis much input from um, British environmental agencies or anything. It was mostly visiting researchers from many countries. So the issues in some of these states, which may on paper be part of the UK or part of the USA, so many of the issues are very similar. So what we're writing about in the paper, I think, uh, applies to those states um, just as much as it applies to uh, fully independent small island states. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. Um, I forgot to mention it earlier, but we have been recording this webinar, and we'll be archiving it at openchannels.org slash webinars. I'll have it up in about an hour. Uh, so you want to share it with any of your colleagues, feel free to do so. Um, again, thank you all so much for presenting for us today, and thank you all in the audience for joining us today. Uh, make sure you download the handouts there before you leave, uh, or just Google uh, the paper then. And uh, we will all see you on the next webinar. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.